Hello everyone, welcome back to another session of The Analyst for 20th of August 2023. So today we will be looking at the most important news and articles from the Indian Express and the Hindu. Looking at the developed contents, we see that the very first article is about the Global South where our External Affairs Minister is talking about the importance of the Global South. The next article is regarding the universal basic income because specifically a state of India has announced some particular schemes related to universal basic income. The next article will be regarding how the sites on celestial bodies such as moon are named and this is because our latest Chandrayaan 3 mission is successfully landed on a site known as Shiv Shakti named by our Prime Minister. Then the next article is about Aditya L1 mission which is scheduled to launch around the first week of September. Finally we will be concluding with trade agreements because a news related to bilateral investment treaty between British and India is taking place. So before beginning our very first article let me tell you the handout for this discussion is available in the description below so definitely check it out for your own ease of note making now the first article is about our uh, foreign minister's statement in which uh, Jai Shankar is telling that the global south of our world can no longer be compartmentalized into some specific areas. Now why this is important because in GS2 we have some topic known as effect of policies and politics of developed and developing countries and their targets on India. Correct? So here the context is that our uh, external affairs minister while he was addressing the B20 summit which is a summit under the G20 right he told that the global south was largely reduced to being a consumer than a producer and that the global south is now seeking more democratic and diversified re-globalization. Now before going into the details of this topic, let us go through what is the global south in the very first aspect. Now this is a term which we often see every day and discussions have been taken before also on this. Now global south refers to not a geographical term right because we know that the global uh, scale is divided on the basis of say the equator, the tropic of cancer, the tropic of Can capricorn so these are geographical divisions of the world. Now the equator is dividing our world into two parts the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere but here when we add the term global to south this means that this is the term taking on geopolitical connotations. Here we are talking about some countries like say most of the African countries, most of the Asian countries such as China, India, Southeast Asia, right? Then the countries such as Latin America. These are the countries who have some common features between them. These are not geographical features. These features are generally on this particular parameter that we will be discussing. Now see, look at the countries delineated in red. These are countries such as the United States, Canada, the Western European nations, Russia, even some parts of Eastern European countries such as Ukraine. These are countries, if we can say, who are developed countries or collectively also if I exclude the countries uh, countries such as say Russia right these are also countries collectively known as the West right and in 1990s the West become very powerful and influential and the global south the very term actually came after the world was generally classified as a developed developing right so right now we have the latest classification in town that is known as the global north and global south so in a brief introduction we have seen that the global north countries are kind of progressive in nature they are kind of having a high amount of per capita income such as the countries such as uh, you know uh, us canada uh, western european countries russia these are kind of countries who had their development right who started their development kind of earlier than the rest of the world because there are some 
common relations between the global south let us see the very first relation between all of the global south countries are that these are the former colonies of the other nations such as say the us the uk these actually had colonies in say africa the uk had colony in india in australia so these are the colonies the former colonies of the earlier nations then these are also countries who are economies in transition that means these are countries which are developing in nature that means these are seeing their economies being more and more developed populations being increasing over that period of time so these are actually transitioning economies and also according to world bank according to imf these will be the countries who in 2050 will be dominating the rest of the world also the World Bank, the IMF, the leading economists, they say that the BRICS nations or say the Brazil, India, Russia, China, South Africa, these will be the countries who will be dominating the world stage by 2050, as we have also seen in earlier discussions. So these are economies in transition. That means they are transitioning from developing to developed countries in the future. Then these are also the countries in which the social institutions such as say marriage, family, tribal population, these are also kind of traditional, right? If we can say take the uh, example of Asian nations such as Korea, Japan, India, China, these all share some Asian characteristics, right? We still have that amount of mutual friendship between ourselves we have that mutual respect for our elders we still uh, you know uh, pay the emphasis on family institutions we still lay emphasis on marriages which are also very important in our societies so these have some social institutions which are common so similarly the, is in the case of latin america and uh, africa they also share some good amount of social institutions whereas if we see the western nations they have some sense of alienation between the family so i, I can say that in the west they generally follow something known as individualism right so individualism is kind of more prominent in the west and this is also one kind of differentiating factor then most of the global south countries generally lie at the periphery of the west now why because after the 1990s or after the collapse of the soviet union we have seen most of the countries of the global south they kind of skirt the west for various economic uh, you know benefits specifically after the 1990s when countries such as india uh, they followed the liberalization, privatization, and globalization, uh, globalization reforms. And let me tell you, it was not only India. It was also some countries of Latin America, some countries of Africa, which, you know, kind of followed the IEMA for International Monetary Funds formula of liberalizing and opening their uh, economies, thus ushering in the globalization. Now, globalization was very important for the West because there will be companies like say the McDonald's, like there will be companies like the Vodafone who would be very eager to set up shop in uh, emerging markets such as India who, who have a large population. So globalization would definitely help the West because most of the profits, right, would can be taken back to the West by the countries uh, such as the US, the UK and even Russia, right. So they can sell their goods and services here and take the profits there and to sell goods and services we need good proper economic institutions we need good political systems which the west will be trying to broker in the global south so this is another differentiating aspect then we can say that globalization which was ushered during the 1990s by the global north in the global south this is also another kind of differentiating factor because globalization per se was not a significant thing in the West. It is a significant thing in the uh, global South because we have to understand that with globalization, various uh, intricate relations such as food, clothing, and even economic systems became interlinked. So the global South became more and more dependent on such things on the global North. And these came with various issues. The issues, the common issues that the global south face can be seen, uh, can be seen in this kind of context. The 
फर्स्ट इश्यू इज दैट द हिस्टोरिकल इंपेरियल रूल काइंड ऑफ इम्पोवरिश द ग्लोबल साउथ बिकॉज से इफ आई कैन टेक द केस ऑफ इंडिया इंडिया वॉज द रिचेस्ट कंट्री अप टू से दिक्सटीन हंड्रेड सेवेंटीन हंड्रेड वेन द ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी के वेन प्लंड अवर रिसोर्सेज दिस वॉज सीन इन वेरियस लिटरेरी एविडेंस इन इवन द दादा भाई नवरोजीज वर्क ऑफ poverty and un-british india he said that the british drained india and literally built the united kingdom with india's wealth and even the present academic circles such as the uh, you know famous economist irfan habib the famous critic shashi tharoor they also in their works have said that the imperial rule kind of impoverished india and built britain at the cost of india correct there is also famous youtube documentary right on this which i uh, encourage you all to uh, watch right then we have the historical injustice of development because if we understand the global north generally started their development earlier in terms of industrial revolution in terms of the colonialization so they generally kind of started the development earlier and this we can see right now that the global south are right now the consumers not the producers because the global north generally had most of the industries even now they have the most of the industries such as the automobile industry the technologies they all emanate from the western nations and the global uh, north nations the global south are generally consumers of that they are not the producers and this is hurting whom the domestic companies in global south they are not able to grow and they are not able to say become big right then there are also issues of poverty and inequality in the global south right the most of the most of the nations right in the global south are kind of poor suppose if i take the example of sub saharan nations or the african nations some african nations these are one of the most poorest nations in the whole world right so they also have this poverty and inequality issues then the environment and degradation no one can disagree because since the industrial revolution the amount of global greenhouse gas em emitted into the atmosphere by the west and the global north this is so significant that they are not even trying to take the responsibilities as of now because the amount of environmental degradation pollution the amount of climate change that is happening that is primarily attributed to the global north and again this is one of the most you know issues uh, with respect to historical injustices in development then we have also seen some new age conflicts which are brought from the global north to global south firstly we have seen that the west kind of meddles too much in some countries such as say countries such as sudan countries such as afghanistan right countries such as gulf the role of us involvement in these countries cannot be ignored and when i am talking of uh, the us i am talking of the collective west even we if we, we can appreciate that uh, the role of russia in various uh you know internal affairs of some countries cannot be ignored so the amount of influence the global north have on some internal affairs of some other countries is very much and that is why the global south nations do not like this interference now next there is also a recent trend of rising nationalism in some of the global north nations such as countries such as germany countries such as the united states when trump came into power in 2016 they are seeing instances of rising nationalism that means that the global country the western countries are assuming that they are kind of outsourcing most of their uh, produce to the developing nations such as india and china right they are seeing that their jobs are being lost to the immigrants who are coming from india and china into their nations so they are becoming more and more very you know divided on national basis so this is actually leading to deglobalization when it comes to their part so this is also a serious trend then finally 
This is also the age of digital imperialism by, by companies such as Google, Facebook, Amazon, where these companies are trying to dominate the digital space. And from where are they coming from? The West, right? So they are trying to influence the global South countries with various digital tools also. And these are the issues due to which the global South is feeling very stifled. And here, they are brokering for re-globalization. That means the globalization that started from 1990s, we want a re-globalization again. And this means that the countries in the global south, they want to be able to participate more meaningfully in the global economy now, since they are facing these issues. And they want to have more control over their own resources. Because we have seen over the historical injustice, over the digital imperialism, we are losing control. That means we have to gain more control in this era of re-globalization. And how can we, and what are the reasons for that? This is to overcome the challenges of globalization, specifically the dominance of the global north over the global south. So that is why you, we need a new global order. And here we need more and more south to south cooperation. So as to reduce the dependency, right? You have to reduce the dependency on the west. Correct? Then we have to reform the global economic system. The global economic system such as dominated by the World Bank, IMF, these are again counter dominated by the West. So we have to form a new global economic system and even countries such as BRICS, right? Countries dominated by China, they are trying to move away to say de-dollarization. They are trying to trade or say or have some alternative to SWIFT which is a you know global inter messaging system so these are all efforts by these countries right now to actually de reduce their dominance uh, on the you know global north then this is also to promote sustainable development and here how india can be a change maker india have to a change maker and also we have seen that india is taking huge strides from the past instances where we have seen that india is very adept at doing vaccine diplomacy at helping uh, you know nations such as uh, african nations latin america during covid crisis right we have supplied uh, you know huge amounts of vaccines to them then also the amount of rescue operations that india does with respect to various conflicts such as the russia ukraine crisis right such as the gulf crisis so india not only rescues its own citizens but also other nations also so here india is becoming a change maker the amount of diaspora that india has in other countries is also very significant which is also uh, trying to make India a change maker. Then the amount of aid that India provides to countries such as say Sri Lanka who is who was facing a huge economic issue and India generally helped uh, her. So we have seen that India also come to help. Then the amount of success that we get in science and technology right uh, the uh, success of ISRO in Chandrayaan 3 in launching very other satellites. So India is actually becoming a change maker in these aspects. So in the future, it is expected that India will be playing a very big role. Then recently in 2023, our Prime Minister launched a Voice of Global South Summit where we have emphasized the need for one voice, one purpose, right? That means the entire Global South can be concentrated into this manner. And finally, we have to focus on creating more resilient supply chain. That means, say, a shock like COVID crisis, a shock like Russia-Ukraine crisis cannot cripple our entire economic order. We must be having bilateral relations with the countries to have better supply chains, right? Then India must be trying to become a leader, right? Here we have to stress on the Vishwaguru aspect, where we have to say that we are getting an alternative to China. Right, because China is becoming more and more dominant with its own sets of uh, you know terms and conditions. So India can become an alternative to leading the global south. So here we should be trying to remember these aspects. Now with this, let us go to the next article here. We are trying to see that some of the state governments in India are trying to give 
something known as universal basic income through small initiatives. This is important why in GST we have something known as welfare schemes for vulnerable sections of the population by center and states. Right? And here we have to look at the performance of the schemes also. Now Madhya Pradesh has actually raised a financial aid given to women under Lardli Bahna scheme. Now the scheme is good. Right? It is trying to promote women empowerment. But there are some states like Madhya Pradesh, like West Bengal, like some other states which are trying to give these as a form of universal basic income. Now we have to understand the universal basic income here. Now this is what? This is a form of social security measure that actually gives payment to anyone without work. That means we are trying to give a certain amount of people some free benefit. Correct? Now this is actually becoming very popular right now because the global economy is kind of slowing down. It is seeing that we are seeing decreasing demand over a period of time. So the government is thinking that if I give uh, you know free benefits to the people, people will be spending more and this will be increasing our demand of goods and services and specifically in poor economies in accordance uh, apart from say improving demand it can also improve poverty right it can reduce poverty in that manner. So let us understand how this operates. This operates through this mechanism. First it is universal nature that means it is not targeted to a specific population this is targeted to all correct suppose in this scheme of Madhya Pradesh we are saying it is only given to women but in UBI it is actually given to all correct and some state governments are kind of targeting as of today but tomorrow for example it can uh, tell that it this scheme is open to all then it will be periodic in nature for example say it can be say in monthly payments it can be in say quarterly payments but it has to be periodic in nature then it can be a cash payment because cash is the most easy way to use any kind of uh, say uh, transaction then it has to be unconditional that means it cannot be tied to any conditions and finally it has to be paid on an individual basis and not on community basis but can we understand that who are actually the beneficiaries of this universal basic income? It has to be some low income individuals and families because we have to give some free money only to these people, right? Not to all. Then people who are unemployed or say underemployed, who are say facing some difficulty to find jobs. Then people who are caring for children such as say working mothers and also some other dependents say caring for uh, your old uh, parents then people who are disabled or retired because these people find doing some economic activities very difficult so government must be say helping them then people who are working in the informal economy because people uh, working at some say small shops they find very difficult to make their ends meet so government must be trying to do something for them so let us try to understand the benefits and drawbacks of here the first benefit is that it is trying to improve the financial security if i am giving money to people to buy say basic services such as say daily grocery items so it is trying to increase their financial security and also inclusion because if I am sending money, if as a government, if I am sending money to the people, I will be sending money to their bank accounts. So I will be encouraging setting up more and more bank accounts. So it will be also including financial inclusion. Then it is also trying to improve the well-being of the people. Right? Because with more and more financial aid, I am trying to make their lives more better. I am trying to improve their living standards. It is also improving the productivity. Why? Because say I am giving uh, say around 1000 rupees to say beggars who are crippled in nature. Now they can use this 1000 rupees say to eat food, to heal themselves, right? To avail of some medical services. So this will boost their capabilities. So this can help them to find work and hence Later when they will work their incomes will be rising and maybe they will not be requiring this universal basic income later. So it will be helping to boost their capabilities and it will be also increasing social cohesion because you have to understand poverty and inequality sometimes lead to violence in the society. If we give more and more 
free goods to them, it will be reducing the violence and improving the social cohesion. But there are some serious drawbacks. These benefits are kind of limited in nature. The, because the drawbacks become very significant. Because according to Economic Survey of 2016-17, it is said that a UBI of around 7,620 rupees per annum to per Indian would cost 4.9% of GDP, which, which will be more than our food plus fertilizer bill, right? Which will be more than, much more than our food and fertilizer bill. Then it will be also leading to inflation because if I give more and more money to the people, this will be leading to more and more demand of the people and demand is not more, you know, equal to supply here and this will be leading to inflation in the market. It will be also very difficult for the administration to figure out the beneficiaries, right? Because particularly the informal sector, the, you know, um, you know, aged population, and also the implementation of the scheme, linking the bank account, the other card, finding out, you know, even uh, doing some data surveys after the implementation. This is very, uh, this is a nightmare for the administration to even consider it. Then also Gandhiji said that free money will be making, you know, people lazy to work. If I give free money, people will become dependent on the government. It will be running in counter to the productive benefit that we have seen earlier, then people will not be working anymore. Finally, some state governments, some governments also can use this as an electoral manipulation. This will not make our elections no longer free and fair. So, we must be th thinking of a very balanced way. Ahead. Here, we should be looking at alternatives. Now, according to our formal economic advisor, it is a proposed mechanism of quasi UBRI. This is about targeting the poor rural population. We have to say give a certain amount of section, uh, you know, amount of universal basic income in rural areas. Because most of the population we who are poor are found in rural areas. So we must be targeting the rural population. Then we must be trying to do more and more direct benefit transfer such as schemes like PM Kisan which is a DBT scheme right. So direct benefit transfer means direct money to the bank accounts right. Then we must be also thinking of employment guarantee schemes which are already existing. We can improve them such as the Manrega which gives around 100 days of unskilled work to rural areas. So we can also improve these schemes. And finally, we have to also think of long term economic stability. Long term economic stability means that instead of say giving free money, free goods and services in the short term, long term activities such as say building schools, hospitals, this must be prioritized. So this will be boosting the people's capabilities. Then we must be also thinking of microfinancing. Because microfinancing specifically if we can target women, this will be say not limited to monthly payments. This will be given loans and they can set up their own business enterprises. Specifically this will be helping the self-help groups who will be accessing more and more credit and people can get jobs here. People can even create jobs here and lead to more and more reduction in poverty and equality and inequality, right? And finally, if government is even thinking of universal basic income, let government do some pilot projects first. Let government do some private pilot projects in our aspirational districts, right? These are 75 districts in India who have, you know, very low socio-economic conditions. So let us do some, uh, you know, pilot studies here. Correct? Okay. So this will be the word ahead in this respect. Now looking at the next article, this is about the naming of sites on moon. Because in GS3 we have something known as awareness in the field of space. Now here the context is that Prime Minister on Sunday, that means uh, yesterday, he announced that the point or this point where the Pragyan right rover is now landed on the moon this will be known as shiv shakti later the isro chairman k somanathan said that the nations 
राइट हैव द राइट टू नेम देयर ओन लैंडिंग साइट ऑन सेलेस्टियल बॉडी सच एज मून करेक्ट सो दिस साइट विल बी नोन एज शिव शक्ति एंड लेट एस सी हाउ द नेम्स और से द नेमिंग ऑफ सम साइट आर एक्चुअली डन वाई दिस इज इंपॉर्टेंट बिकॉज इन यूपीएससी यू हैव सीन दैट how cyclones are named was a question in our previous year question of mains so also we have to see how sites are actually named on moons here let us see who names the site on the moon formally it is our international astronomical union as we can see these are the countries of around 85 countries as of may 2023 were the members of international astronomical union and india our own india is one of them right here we have to understand it was formed in 1919 correct so it is around 104 years old and this was founded out at brussels belgium the headquarters are at paris correct now the thing that it does it frames guidelines and procedures for naming lunar craters mountains valleys and other features it also leads to some research right communication education and development through various international cooperation and they have generally established some informal practice of naming the sites on the moon for example when the apollo when apollo first landed on the moon right from the us in 1960s the names were actually approved by the international astronomical union and it generally does initially via informal naming right then it also names based on some historical and cultural references for example say the moon has mythological references in almost every religion for example say greek mythology the hindu mythology so it generally also looks at references related to that also and finally it also involves some space agencies such as the nasa the european space agency right so they also are consulted while naming then what are the processes of naming and what are the norms related to that the process is that first there will be some working groups in the iau and these working groups will be consisting of some experts these are experts in planetary sciences lunar uh, geology etc correct then the review will be done by voting mechanism that means these experts will be voting on the name which was decided informally correct they will be voting on them then the names will be approved right in the official iau nomenclature and these will be used on maps and publications later on correct any objections if there are any for example between these own members or say from the uh, public at large they has to be addressed to the general secretary via mail right within 3 months right within 3 months of publication on its website now these are very intricate details and sometimes these are the very details which were becoming very significant in upsc mains because they have asked questions like this with respect to cyclones in india then what are the norms for naming space objects the norms are that names should be very simple right that everyone can pronounce it right it has to be clear and unambiguous it cannot be an indirect reference to any political event right then no names must be having any political military or religious significance it has to be neutral a very secular kind of thing right except for names of political figures prior to 19th century right this is the exception and also we can commemorate people right who have been dead for around 3 years correct 3 years is the minimum cut off okay now what are some existing names on the moon the existing name is sarabhai crater on the moon and when 2008 chandrayaan 3 you know landed on the moon crash landed on the moon that site was known as jawahar sthal and here let us have some concluding thoughts that see moon is a collective entity that means moon is no one's right moon in moon is no one's territory it is everyone's territory 
it is no one's exclusive so generally if we have landed our chandrayaan 3 on moon we generally we can name that site right it is no wrong that we are doing that is what that is why we have to understand it is not under any jurisdiction of any country and also according to outer space treaty it is specifically mentioned that we the setting of some common principle for space exploration is always welcome right so if we name our site as shiv shakti we are not doing anything bad here correct so this is our concluding thoughts here now the aditya l1 mission aditya in aditya l1 mission we have some progress that scientists at the space physics laboratory under vikram sarabhai space center are getting ready to launch the aditya l1 mission the launch is around in the very first week of september and this is very important because it will be totally unlocking the secrets of our solar system and also our chandrayaan 3 has landed recently this will be adding another feather in the cap of isro now let us understand why to study the sun at all we have to understand the sun is our closest star right and here we have to understand the sun also has various layers such as the outer layer is known as corona corona is the outer layer of the uh, sun's atmosphere which is very hot correct then we have some aspects of sun which is known as prominence which is this amount of solar flares then we have something known as convection zone radiation zone which is inside of the sun and at the very inside we have sun's core then we have also some layers of the sun such as photosphere and chromosphere and the sun while it is very close to us it is also one of the most mysterious things because it is so bright that we cannot even stare at with our naked eyes even some sensitive instruments such as satellites study missions cannot go too close to the sun because it is very hot it is in millions of degrees right any metal can melt there so that is why many explorations have over the time uh, you know try to study the sun and here we have to study the sun because we need to look at the origin and evolution of stars and also we have the closest stars here we have to look at how stars form generally we know stars form by the coalescing of various space debris when the various space debris when they are scattered away they come together via force of gravity right they form a core and this is our sun's core but how they form in which dynamic they form how long they took to form these are still some mysteries that we are yet to figure out so this is why we need to study our sun and also we have to understand while sun is situated millions of you know you know kilometers away miles away it still has some influence on earth right specifically so solar flares solar flares are sudden outbursts from the suns right so it can depend our uh, it, it can impact our weather on our earth and climate it can also predict uh, you know if we try to study the sun we can predict space weather events then some new technologies for solar energy how to add, uh, you know harness solar energy using solar cells solar panels that can also be studied properly so that is why india has also tried to launch a solar mission in this respect now the other missions to the sun by nasa is our solar uh, parker solar probe then uh, european space agency has launched a solar orbiter ulysses and japan uh, you know space exploration has launched henod so these are the other solar missions to the sun and india is launching the aditya l1 mission the aditya l1 contains a term l1 or lagrange 1 which means that this is our earth right and this is our sun there are various lagrange points or points where there is a very stable gravity field that means if we place certain objects in our lagrange 1 in our lagrange 2 lagrange 3 4 5 these are very stable points on the earth's you know gravity field and these are points which are influenced by gravity fields of earth and the sun
So here, if we can say assume, if I can place a certain object here, it will stay unaffected by the gravity field of both Earth and Sun. So that we can make some precise astronomical measurements and experiments. Now, the Aditya L1 mission will be situated around 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. And it is India's first mission to study the Sun. Here, it will be carrying seven payloads. Four will be carrying remote sensing survey on the sun right it will be looking at the various terrains of the sun and three will be looking at in situ observation that means it will be peering into the depths of the sun the seven payloads are mentioned here the first is known as VELC right which will be carrying out a emission line coronagraph right then it will be studying at solar ultraviolet by the suit then we have something known as solexis then we some, some have something known as hell one os then aspects then we have something known as papa which is the uh, news which is actually concerning of here we are trying to uh, you know look at various plasma and various ele charged electron particles from the sun so here we'll be looking at how sun tries to eject electrons some charged particles towards earth and this is known as plasma analyzer package for aditya or papa and also we will be having advanced triaxial high resolution digital magnetometers here we'll be looking at various sensitive instruments which are packed into this mission and this will be taken to the uh, you know L1 Lagrange by our polar satellite launch vehicle or PSLV. Here the objectives of the Aditya L1 mission is to study the coronal heating problem. Here we have to see why the sun's atmosphere is heated to such abnormally high temperatures which is a mystery. Correct? Then we will be looking at the origins of the coronal mass ejections which are huge explosions of solar plasma which can, if it, if it becomes too huge, it can even disrupt the Earth's space environment. And it is also suspected that this is one of the reasons why even dinosaurs became exempt in, you know, in the entire world. Finally, it will be also studying the dynamics of space weather. Because we have to understand, we have various satellites in our uh, external, uh, you know, space, right? There are also various communication uh, systems in our Earth, which is very sensitive to our solar flares. So we have to predict the solar flares so we can uh, be prepared for some events. Now, when we look at the final uh, article here, here India and UK is trying to uh, finalize its free trade agreement, and they have started the. Uh, negotiations for revisiting its 2015 bilateral investment treaty. Now to understand this, first we need to look at what is a trade agreement. Now, any two countries to trade, they need some formal agreement between them. For the trade of goods and services, they need to have some formal agreement, they need to negotiate something beforehand. So trade agreement is a legally binding treaty or agreement between the two nations where it defines the terms of trade between them. And trade agreements cover a wide range of topics. It covers law, it covers tariffs, quota, investment, intellectual property and services also. Right? So this is a comprehensive agreement. And here, if we can see international trade agreements are kind of divided into two types. First is a preferential trade agreement, which we can see here. Uh, such as example is India-Afghanistan preferential trade agreement, which is trying to say that each country will be having a mutually agreed positive list. That means this list will be having very low tariffs or even some zero duties. So this is a very first state of say beginning negotiations between the two countries by having some agreement. Here we can have some multilateral agreement and also some bilateral agreement. That means uh, bilateral agreement be, will be between one to one countries and here it will be between various countries. Then we have also something known as free trade agreement. Free trade agreement we have to understand which are much more than PTAs. It will be covering you know zero uh, say duties on specific goods. It will be having tariff concessions on specific goods. That means we cannot imply any uh, you know tariff on these goods what we can do we can have some 
negative lists that means these are some excluded items on which there will be normal trade uh, and tariffs will be there but on other goods there can be absolutely no tariffs correct this is with respect to goods and one example we have is sri lanka india ft the next step of ft itself is comprehensive economic cooperation agreement now this is more comprehensive than fta because here this will be covering negotiation on trade tariff and uh, trade tariff quotas right which will be helping the countries to mutually agree on some tariff on some quotas between some countries right and say take concessions for example with malaysia we have this ceca the most advanced form of free trade agreement is the comprehensive economic partnership agreement or economic cooperation and trade agreement here we are not only concerned about say goods we are also concerned about the intellectual property rights we are also concerned about some mutual laws that we have to make which we are also uh, concerned about trade facilitation or some customs cooperations so these are the comprehensive agreement that a country can make with respect to free trade agreement here we have a very comprehensive agreement with uh, say india japan and also ever as of recently we have seen we have try, uh, signed you know cec pa with uh, mauritius with uae and australia so in the last year of 2022 india has tried to sign this comprehensive uh, you know partnership agreements and also the agreements for which negotiations are launched in 2022 we have to understand this is the india uk the negotiations are also uh, you know going on with the european union and that is why some data is also given here we can see that india is now trying to go into many bilateral and multilateral such as the eu trade agreements which will be trying to boost india's uh, you know trade in the near future now coming to bilateral trade in bilateral investment treaties right we have to understand that these are with respect to investment these are not with respect to you know goods these are with respect to investment because we know we have some investment types such as the foreign institutional investments who bring in, in, in investments in india we have also fdi who bring in investment in india so we need some investment treaties so these are very crucial for promotion of goods investment or service investment in india coming from abroad and when you as an investor will be coming from abroad you will be concerned with your own investment safety security uh, you know laws and regulations so that is why some countries right will be framing bilateral investment agreements correct for example say india and uk so they generally began their you know bilateral investment treaty negotiations in 1990s right which country which company will be coming how they will be investing in our nation so the rules of the game are actually decided here and the objective is to set up regulatory behavior right so that their investment can be safe and it can also create some jobs in india so the regulation has to be very good then we cannot discriminate between in indian investor and foreign investor then the profits that the investors will be making in india they can be easily sent to abroad then there will be some dispute resolution mechanism so these are the objectives of bilateral investment treaties now india and uk have been uh, having a investment treaty since 2015-16 right and there are some issues with that and these are also the issues which are hindering india uk to have a fta so right now they're negotiating their ftas and bit or bilateral investment treaty are a very crucial co component of their negotiations so let us see what the negotiations finally come up okay so with this i conclude today's discussion thank you for attending to the session and all the best for you all till we meet again